by uh, Titus Neuper uh, from Zurich. And Titus is going to tell us about uh, the topo topology bands from homotopy theory. So Titus, whenever you, you want, yeah. please share your screen. And, and we get All right, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Let me share my iPad screen here. And I hope you can see it. I guess you see it now, right? And here's Afghanistan updates. Well, OK, <laughs> let's leave that out of the way for a little bit. Um, uh, so uh, yes, my plan for these uh, two lectures today and tomorrow is um, to give you um, basically a viewpoint. It's going to be a bit complementary to what uh, Jane Cano was talking about and also what uh, Andre Bernick was mentioning in many places of his talk on you know topological band theory and uh i think that the basically the big trajectory of topological band theory is that it started out um with you know homotopy type um uh, mathematics meaning that you compute topological invariants from integrals of very curvature of of very uh connections and and things like that and then uh, it moved more to uh, discrete topology, discrete objects. And that is, uh, you know, this uh, advent of topological quantum chemistry, where you talk about like putting specific orbitals and then uh, specific um, uh, Vanier, Vanier orbitals and, and, you know, which Wyckoff position they are in. You have finite groups that you deal with and you list uh, uh, these group eigenvalues, build symmetry indicators, that's very discrete. But uh, you know we are moving forward with this field, and it's kind of going back in history a little bit um, uh, that you know there's kind of a, a re a resurgence of this uh, idea of homotopies, like of co continuous invariance or invariance computed from uh, continuous quantities that uh, are able to resolve certain topologies that uh, that are maybe missed by topological quantum chemistry, and that was, uh, I mean, also a big point of Andre's talk. So um, for these two lectures, I wanted to cover four, uh, uh, four things, uh, and they're written out here. So it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit slower, I guess, than the previous lectures. Um, so I'll write everything on the iPad. Um, but I hope it's kind of giving you a little, you know, filling in maybe some gaps or some underpinnings that, that uh, you know, at the lightning speed sometimes are, are a little bit hard to get. And in particular, the uh, the first two uh, uh, points here, which I hope I can cover today, are, are also captured in these uh, lecture notes that I will um, uh, that I write here. So, if you want more details, you can look that up there. But they are also the basis for what I want to talk about tomorrow. So, um, so bear with me um, for these points, and and tomorrow we go to really more. Um, yeah, more contemporary things like like non-Hermitian topology and and uh, also this distinction between stable and fragile and so on. Okay, so again, if you have questions, type them up. Uh, I'm looking at the Q and A, and and uh, we'll be seeing that. And I guess you know, if not, then I'll be reminded of it. All right. Um, so let's go uh, and talk about Wilson loops. Um, so that's section one. And um, um, the framework, yes. Titus, I'm afraid that, that we are not seeing what you're writing. Oh, you're not? The screen is frozen. I think it's frozen, yeah. Can you try to write you something don't? again? I'm Please. writing something, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm currently writing something, so you don't no. see that? No, no maybe, okay. maybe I stop sharing I can... and share again. And yeah, see. let me do that. But previously it worked, right? Uh, so that's strange. Sure. Now okay. you see that addition, but let's see. Do you see that I'm writing something? Now we see it. All right, very good. Then uh, let's um, get rid of this. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I hope that's now done. It's also interesting that when I do screen sharing, my iPad shows a very different time than what actually the time is, but I don't know. All right. Um, so, um, 
but now the problem is that I have a very ugly sound on my ear. This is not. We don't. We don't. It's not sustainable, unfortunately. Let me see. Ah, oh, it's gone. Okay. Do you do you still hear me, right? And I can you say something? I want to make sure I hear you. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. I mean, I don't know. I had just like a really something weird on my ear. Okay, good. So Wilson loops. So all of what I'm talking about is going to be in the domain of, of band theory. So we are, you know, going to have K space available. We have non-interacting systems and we look um, exclusively at, at gap systems. So um, so we can always, you know, um, rely on, on, on bands and on translational symmetry so that we have K resolution. Um, and basically the idea is that we want to go beyond this tenfold way that, uh, that Jen mentioned in her talk and you know, find out how crystal symmetry can you know, enrich um, all of this. So um, to start really you know, at the basis, uh, let's start with the basis. And that is you know, a Bloch state, uh, which can be written you know, it depends on momentum and on um, maybe some orbital alpha in the unit cell. And if I write it as a wave function, not as a state, then it also depends on, you know, whatever basis I, I expand it in. So in position basis, for instance, and um, then it can be expanded in uh, local basis functions. So kind of one year functions um, that are these phi's here. And uh, they have, in principle, first of all, the same labels alpha, and they are um, basically characterizing an orbital that is sitting somewhere in a unit cell uh, that is as the unit cell coordinate capital R. And then in that unit cell, you have somewhere the atom, and that sits at the, at the position little r alpha, because it's the atom with the number alpha or the orbital with number alpha. So it's like an orbital index. And um, and then that you know there sits this wave function phi. Yeah, so that's the picture. And that our alpha is often actually kind of neglected, but um, but it's important if you want to um, if you want to compute uh, transport properties or so. Um, so it's sometimes important to keep that in mind. This this little spatial resolution within the unit cell, and that alpha for the purpose of of our talk is is you know running over n different. Um, uh, orbitals that we have in every unit cell. Okay, and now, uh, you know, based on this, the Bloch Hamiltonian, um, just for good measure, let me write it down, is a matrix that uh, has these indices alpha and beta, depends on this momentum k, and is basically just um, uh, integral, you know, the uh, expectation value or the, of these um, functions with respect to some Hamiltonian, whatever governs your uh, your electrons, uh, including the lattice potential and everything, uh, that's an operator now. This this h hat, right? All right, and um, and then the Bloch eigenstates um, they are they are written in the band basis now. So this is like from alpha we can go to n the bands, um, and they. Uh, also depend on K and R, and R, and they are some linear combination with, in, with coefficients U, K, and alpha of these uh, phi functions. Okay. And we have the sum over alpha here to N. And, uh, and then, you know, the Hamiltonian is diagonalized by these, uh, by these U of K. So the, the, the Bloch Hamiltonian U alpha beta of K uh, times u k n beta is some band energy epsilon n um, times u k n alpha. Okay, so much um, uh, for this. Uh, yeah, I should sum over beta. So much for this kind of um, you know theoretical underpinning. And now, how do we define properly this Wilson loop operator, which is going to be the basis for you know most of the topological features that I'll explain in my lecture. I will um, define it sort of properly in a non-abelian, meaning in a multiband situation. And uh, the key for that um, 
is the uh, non-abelian barrier connection. So the non-abelian barrier connection, I can compute now from this U K uh, K N. And this is a matrix with indices M and N, and these run only over the occupied bands. Uh, let's say one to capital M instead of N, just the occupied ones. It is uh, depending on, um, on K again, and uh, is itself a matrix, but also a vector valued quantity because I can I take the derivative with respect to K um, of uh, UKM and uh, N in these two bands. Okay, so now this matrix I can um, basically turn into this Wilson loop operator in the following way. I uh, take um, some path, a loop to be precise in K space. And um, along this path, I take the exponential path ordered of the integral um, of, this, uh, of this quantity of this uh, non-abelian barrier connection. Okay. And uh, in principle, I can take any path, but um, you know, it, I'll talk about in a moment about the uh, um, uh, gauge degrees of freedom here, but you know, typically I want to take a loop so that it doesn't depend on the end, uh, you know, for instance, on the gauge in the end states. Okay, so, and the path ordering, so this overbar here is necessary because, um, because this, uh, this A of K is a matrix. Huh? So this thing is also an M by M matrix. Okay, now you wonder in what basis is this, is this matrix written? And um, this becomes more apparent when we use an alternative representation of this thing. And that's also more useful for a numerical evaluation. Um, and that looks like, like so. Um, you start from some momentum K zero and take the block state there. And then um, you compute instead of this you know, uh, derivative because this derivative here is actually numerically uh, basically inaccessible let's say, because you need to choose a smooth gauge to make sense of that. If you, know, if you want to do this with finite differences and you don't have the same smooth gauge everywhere, um, there's no real meaningful um, uh, way of deducing this. So what you can do instead is you chop up your path in, in many small um, dots, many small points, and, uh, and then take the uh, K i omega along this path, and you start at some K zero uh, that I already introduced. So let's say that this i runs from one, to, um, i runs from one uh, to capital S. Uh, then the definition of this Wilson loop is um, i equal to one to S, and then um, you actually have the product of projectors um, on these block states. And um, then you close it off with U at K zero in band M in another, potentially another band. And that, um, uh, that is uh, basically, you know, what, what now gives you a matrix, this choice of N and M here. There's the question why we cannot choose a smooth uh, gauge. Well, we can in principle, but uh, in a situation with many bands and also in particular with many dimensions, it's just numerically very hard. So in 1D, you can kind of construct a smooth gauge relatively easily. 2D, it's already challenging in a general many band situation. So it's just a numerical challenge. You just have to run some complicated algorithm that's, I don't know whether for 3D, this is really something, yeah. All right, thanks for the question. Ah, th I'm done, right? Did I do that correctly? I, I didn't click on answer live before I answered it. Is this a problem? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's correct. That's perfect. Oh, okay, <laughs> good, thanks. 
All right, so that's how we should uh, compute this in principle. And uh, now you see that this is uh, basis dependent. I mean, dependent on this choice of u of k uh, zero. Um, however, so you would say it's gauge covariant basically. Yeah, if you do a gauge, gauge transformation at this k zero to the u, the uh, w uh, will you know transform in a gauge covariant way. So you'll have the gauge transformation on the left and the right. Um, now, what is gauge invariant uh, about it? Uh, what's gauge invariant is uh, is uh, the spectrum. Yeah, so that's important, uh, and that's even independent of k zero. That's also important to know. So where that I pick this base point, it doesn't matter. Matter. <clears throat> It, 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 yeah, so that's the question. Uh, does the definition of the Wilson loop require the degeneracy of bands? No, it does not require that they are degenerate. This thing is defined on the uh, full subspace of occupied bands, but we are not really interested where they are in, in energy specifically. There can, however, be degeneracy. So the formalism is, is um, um, you know, is, is still works with degeneracies. So. Yeah, it's just more powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not required. Thanks again. OK. And uh, so now the point that I want to make is that the Wilson loop spectrum um, is uh, related to the spectrum of the uh, position operator projected into the uh, degrees of freedom of the occupied bands projected. So, um, you know, as I said, spectrum is gauge invariant, so it should carry some physical information. And the point is it does, and uh, will relate it uh, to this uh, spectrum of the uh, position operator. Yes, that's correct, uh, Mikael. Uh, the uh, the K zero independence is just simply because uh, if you look at the full expression and you can kind of cycle through, it's 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 like the trace of a of a product of projectors, including the K zero, and uh, and then the cyclicity of the trace uh, would you know is why um, why this is part, uh, why this is K zero independent. Um, but that's only for closed paths, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the anonymous attendee will be happy to see why we compute this quantity throughout the rest of the lecture, essentially, but specifically also now. So I'll just be patient, we'll, we'll get there. Um, uh, the eigenstates, um, yes, the eigenstates of the Wilson loop, um, they, they have a, a meaning. They are essentially the Vanier centers um, of the, so if you want to, you, you have Vanier states that I talked about, which are the atomic ones um, from which you build your entire model. But now we talk about the occupied subspace and if I want to represent just this subspace also with a, with a bunch of Vanier functions, so localized wave functions, then uh, these are the eigenstates that can be, are related to the eigenstates of these Wilson loops. So that, that's maybe the, yeah, so there's a uh, sense in which these have a meaning. Uh, w is a unitary operator. Uh, The gauge invariant quantity is the integral along a particular closed path. Uh, so the gauge invariant quantity is for any chosen path. So the path is not gauge dependent. It's like the eigenstates on these paths that are gauge dependent. So fixing the path, the spectrum is gauge, is gauge invariant. For in your. All right, thanks. Oh, this is really very interactive.
Amazing. Let's see how far I get. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about this projected position operator. So, um, so, um, so what is that? So um, the position operator, and for that we look at the specific path. Um, we look at, let's say, for simplicity, a two D system, or let's do the following: we have uh, one momentum k x. And um, I will look at the path that goes in parallel this, to this kx, but a straight line, so that um, the remaining momenta um, vector k are still good quantum numbers. So I can label the path by these vector k quantum numbers. And so note now that all vectors so far I wrote as underline k. So this underline k is kx uh, plus k vector. Yeah. So I will. Trying to be a bit careful with my notation here, uh, okay, unless I forgot the underlines. Um, and uh, and so uh, so now we want to look at such paths. So um, we can also uh, look at the now we, and we want to look at the spectrum of the x operator. So the one that corresponds to this momentum kx x position operator, and we want to project that into the occupied bands. And the projector itself can now depend on these other momenta. They are still all good quantum numbers in that sense. Even if I determine the position in x direction, the y and z uh, momenta are still uh, good quantum numbers. OK, so um, the projector is, is defined as follows, dkx 2 pi uh, psi kn. Um, Psi, oh, see, here uh, is my inconsistency. This should be this k. Okay, so I'm basically taking my block states and I integrate over 1k, sum of all occupied bands, and that's this projector. And I'm just sandwiching um, the x operator with this projector. So this is the operator I'm now interested in, yeah, and this spectrum of this operator. Okay. Um, this thing has um, has eigenfunctions, so let's write the eigenvalue problem of this uh, of, of this operator. So this is p x p minus theta, and it has still good quantum number k uh, on some eigenstate psi of k equal to zero. That's the eigenvalue problem. This is the eigenvalue I'm interested in, and. Um, this here is uh, simply I can write an ansatz uh, for this wave function, dkx um, f of k and n. Uh, that's basically just a c uh, element c, some c number to expand the function, and the basis is psi of k and n. Sorry, did the wrong k again. No, that's the right k. Yeah. Uh, yes, right. Okay, so um, so these are my my Bloch eigenstates. So this is my ansatz for this for this eigenstate of um, of the position operator. And now um, what I can do is I can just uh, skip the calculation because um, it's not so illuminating. Um, but I can tell you what the result would be. Um, and the result is uh, the derivative. So of course the position operator and the derivative along kx um, are you know, related. That's also what, what Jen was already mentioning. Um, and I get now two contributions to this expectation value. Note that I take here the, um, this, my eigenstate uh, ansatz and on the left I project on some um, fig uh, Bloch eigenstate. And then I get um, this form AX, the X component of this um, non abelian uh, Barry connection times F of K and M KX. All right. So, uh, okay, very good question for uh, Lorenzo. Um, the position operator as such, we have to be a bit careful um, because I'm slipping the steps. I don't really, I can't really pinpoint where I'm 
you know, making the uh, approximation. In principle, um, one has to use a regularized position operator, and that would be e to the i uh, x times uh, q, like the smallest um, momentum spacing, or e to the i uh, x over l, 2 pi x over l. Um, that is the proper position operator to use on a uh, in on a on a system that has periodic boundary conditions and uh, and a lattice. I'm cheating a little bit by kind of uh, linearly approximating this position operator and uh, write it as a uh, partial k, but a uh, very good point uh, by Lorenzo. So there are some subtleties in this derivation, which I'm skipping. Uh, you can go to the lecture notes to, to uh, uh, look at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yeah, hexagonal Brillouin zone. Uh, you can you can always uh, instead of this guy, um, you know, you can use this. Um, that's not very nice. Yeah. This as a Brillouin zone. Then, you know, you can choose these paths. Yeah. Can you read out loud the? Oh, the sorry. Questions? The other people don't see the question. Okay, how should we choose the path for the Wilson loop calculation in the case, for instance, hexagonal, hexagonal Brillouin zone? Can you comment on that, please? So I can choose it parallel to one of the uh, basis vectors and momentum space. Yeah, one of the reciprocal uh, lattice vectors. Um, so these these paths would be probably useful, or these. It depends on the, uh, you know, it will later relate it to the boundary by boundary correspondence, and it depends on the boundary condition that I impose. So you want the path to be such that the momentum along the boundary is, is a good quantum number still. Okay, thanks, Maya, for reminding me of that. I was always under the impression that everybody sees those questions, but somehow I guess not, right? It's broadcasted in YouTube too, and I think they don't see the question. Oh, the YouTube body. Oh, all right. I see. Good. Very good. Thanks. Okay. So what we see now is that F piece is kind of not so interesting. It's the one that we we would expect, right? But then uh, there's a part uh, that has to do with this non abelian Barry connection, and um, essentially uh, when we integrate now both uh, both sides of this equation. What we uh, what we get um, there is uh, w of k. That's the integral of this uh, a term. Um, and we choose say like, some k zero. I mean, I could actually I should maybe write here not pi, but some um, k x zero. Um, is equal to e to the i theta of k f k n, huh? also at k x zero. So, um, so we see that the eigenvalues of the projected position operator, um, uh, if we compare this to the eigenvalue equation of the projected position operator, and those um, of the Wilson loop, the Wilson loop operator again, they are uh, closely related, namely um, as follows, theta, and now I'm giving them uh, also a band label essentially, uh, if I diagonalize, um, and then uh, that of the position operator gets also a K label and an additional uh, position label X. Um, and they are, these, uh, sorry, full sign. They are related to those of the uh, Wilson loop eigenvalues. Um, and what I'm claiming is that they are related by a, by a constant that is uh, is uh, integer number. Um, it goes from one to n. And the reason is the following. Think about the spectrum. So the spectrum of this Wilson loop operator has m eigenvalues, uh, m Wilson loop eigenvalues. And there are, there must be for the position operator, let's say Lx, that's the number of unit cells times m uh, eigenvalues 
of uh, PXP. Yeah? And they are related like this. So if I have a system which has many unit cells, so X equal to one, two, three, four, and so forth, then um, in each unit cell, I have, uh, oops, I wanted to do that. Um, in each unit cell, I have the same spectrum of the Wilson loop eigenvalues repeated as eigenvalues of the projected position operator. And the physical interpretation is that there are Vanier centers in these occupied bands sitting at these, um, at these positions, yeah? So these uh, theta A of K, they, they, they arrange between zero and two pi. And then the full spectrum of the position operator is just repeating that in every unit cell. Okay, so um, we have, uh, we can, you know, look at the bunch of examples here um, to, to exploit this basically. Um, one is the, the, uh, the SSH chain, which you have already seen. And I'm not going to repeat the Hamiltonian for that. Uh, this is kind of probably no now, but you remember there's a, topo, a topological and a trivial phase. And uh, of course it's a little bit yeah, use of language to call this topological, but anyways, in the topological phase, um, the uh, Vanier centers of this chain, they sit in the, um, uh, basically in the middle between unit cells. If, um, actually maybe I should write it. No, I should probably do this the other way around. I should um, think of the box here as the, um, as the unit cell and then say at the topological phase, the one year center sit right between the unit cells so that you cut one of these one year centers uh, at the termination of the 1D crystal and that gives you this topological end state. And um, in the trivial case, uh, the one year centers um, sit uh, right in the, uh, in the middle of the unit cells and nothing special happens when you cut the crystal. And this corresponds to uh, this loop eigenvalues uh, theta is equal to um, basically pi and here theta is equal to zero. Yeah? So you would compute this. Of course, there you only need single band formalism because it's just in one, um, uh, in one band occupied, one occupied band, but that's kind of, you know, the correspondence here. And um, another example that we've seen is the churn insulator. And there, we, we know that there is the churn number as a topological quantity to uh, characterize it. And um, the churn number we've also seen before, we can write that as trace of a y of k minus uh, partial, as a partial k, as of the curl of a, basically uh, the curl of um, this uh, Barry uh, connection, um, trace x of k and that is now already adapted for the many band version and um, now if we choose a gauge that can always be done uh, such that this term is equal to zero then um, what we obtain is um, that you know, this whole contribution goes just to, the, you know, everything comes from the second term. And um, then we can write this as uh, basically um, I over two pi, I guess in the, yeah. We can split off the integral between uh, KY and KX. And then we just have KY and then dkx uh, trace over a x of k underscore. And this, however, is nothing but the sum over, uh, you know, all these eigenvalues a i um, at k y of the Wilson loops. So what, what we get is the churn number is 
the winding number, this is kind of the winding number of these Wilson loop eigenvalues. So the churn number is, the, is this uh, uh, winding number of this loop. Eigenvalues. Now there is a question. Uh, do the co components of the projected position operator along different direction always commute? What would it mean that we find we can find the basis of functions whose one-year centers are well localized along all directions at the same time? That is a very good question, uh, Mikkel. Um, the answer is that they do not always commute, or rather in general, they do not commute. And uh, that means also that we cannot localize um, necessarily completely, right? You cannot build a sort of a delta function, a uh, one year function. They always have to spread in certain directions. You can make it in one direction, you can make it uh, better defined, but uh, then at the expense of extending it the other direction. And now this is a very pointed question also to the case of the churn insulator. Actually, uh, the question is not only how much can you, I mean, are they perfectly, so they're not perfectly commuting in general, but how localized can you make the wave functions in X and Y? And uh, in general, in, in, in most insulators, in boring insulators, whether they are the most or not is another question. Most in, in boring insulators, you can exponentially localize uh, these states simultaneously in, in all directions. If you have a topological uh, constraint, and here and specifically a churn number, you cannot do that. So, um, so, the, so that's a very good question. So um, the um, eigenstates, uh, uh, I'm gonna write that here. So the one year states are not exponentially localizable in all directions simultaneously if uh, c is not equal to zero. So we don't, I don't prove that here, but, uh, but um, that is just a statement. Uh, that is very important for what we'll discuss later on. That this whole actually underlies a lot of this topological quantum chemistry. Um, here's another question: Is the expected value of the position operator in one direction gauge invariant? If so, does it correspond to the actual position of the one year function? Yes, it is. Um, um, yes, it is. And uh, well, the position of the one year function. So if you have a one-dimensional system, then that's an absolute uh, true statement. But if you have a two-dimensional system, you see that it depends still on the perpendicular momentum, what the eigenvalue is. So it's gauge invariant, but you have a range of eigenvalues. So the uh, point where you put the one year function is still a little bit arbitrary. So there's no, in a 2D system already, there's no like single place to put it, the one year function because, so let's just do this example of the churn insulator now. That's the extreme one. So um, I say that there's a winding of these eigenvalues. So I should uh, also um, you know, provide that. Um, sorry, this is X. Um, so what, what you find is um, as you change Ky from zero to two pi is, and you've seen that picture before actually, um, is that this, uh, this one if function winds and so at every position X, you have a number of crossings that cause of this red line. And this is the unit cell now. So this unit cell one, two, three, that corresponds to the churn number. So, so here, uh, you know, if I draw a line like this, I have one crossing and that corresponds to churn number equal to one for instance, yeah, and so you could imagine that there are more lines that are crossing or, yeah, right. Um, good, so I hope that is answering this question. Um, 
Next question. Can you choose a gauge that makes the first term vanish, but you can you extend the wait, what you can choose a gauge that makes the first term vanish, but can you extend the same gauge over all the Brillouin zone? That is possible, but not, yes, that's possible. Yeah. You cannot um, do that in both directions, but you can always shuffle basically the the the, the non-smoothness either to AX or AY. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So so this is now what's called a spectral flow. Yeah. So there is this shift of the one year position. And you see, of course, the spectrum needs to be periodic um, uh, as k advances by 2 pi. So at the top and the bottom of my drawing, I better have the same uh, spectrum. Yeah? That, that, that's why this is topological. Yeah. All right. Um, before, uh, so for later reference, before I continue, let me just um, add some symmetry constraints for these Wilson loops, because the churn insulator is really the simplest example. It doesn't have any symmetries, but all, all the interesting or no, sort of refined, refined systems, they, they all uh, will rely on some uh, spatial symmetries, time reversal symmetry, and so forth. Um, so. Uh, let me be just brief and list them. So there's time reversal symmetry. And you can ask yourself, what is time reversal symmetry going to do to these um, Wilson loop eigenvalues, if I have one? And um, that for one time reversal symmetry is uh, changing uh, k to minus k. So you would expect a, a minus k here. And uh, it does two more things. It reverses the path and it complex conjugates. And these two things kind of cancel each other in the sense that there's no additional minus here. So this is a plus, yeah? That the path ordering is reversed and there's complex conjugation. There's somewhere an I that kind of, yeah, makes that this here. Um, also maybe uh, uh, Kramer's uh, pairs uh, uh, are also present in the Wilson loop spectrum. So if you have a system that has Kramer's pairs because T squared is equal to minus one um, and you compute its Wilson loop, that will also have these degeneracies uh, like the Kramer's uh, crossings at uh, time reversal invariant momenta, just to sort of keep that in mind. Uh, now Miguel goes comes back uh, in the relation to the previous question. Can we state that for systems with boring topology in two D, for example, we can always locate the one year center by computing the Wilson spectrum twice, one for each reciprocal space direction, since there are no obstruction. Uh, yes, I I'd say uh, that is um, possible. Yes, you might still have some wiggling room, kind of where you exactly put that Wilson loop. Uh, that one year center, but if it's at a high symmetry position, then you should, um, you should, you know, it should be pinned to exactly that position. Yeah. All right. Time reversal symmetry. Then we have inversion, or um, for later reference, I'll also say that this is in 2D uh, uh, C2 symmetry. Um, so what it, uh, uh, what it does is uh, actually quite interesting. The inversion, of course, or it's in two dimension C2, which also reverts both uh, coordinate axes, that reverts the path. So it uh, will go, will set theta to minus theta by this ordering being reversed. And it also um, inverts the momenta perpendicular to the path. So that's this, it, it will induce some sort of spectral, it's like a particle hole symmetry. So this is like a particle hole symmetry in the Wilson loop spectrum. Yeah, quote unquote. And uh, then sometimes the combination of uh, time reversal with inversion or T times C2 is relevant and you can just combine the two, but since we'll uh, use it uh, hopefully tomorrow, um, I'm just going to uh, make that here too. So it, it's, it's just, uh, Mirror symmetry essentially in this, in this, uh, sorry, uh, um, not a mirror, like a chiral symmetry in this spectrum. So it sends data to minus data at the same k. Okay, good. Enough of that. 
Um, next physical and physically important thing that I want to uh, teach you about is the uh, bulk boundary correspondence of these topological systems. So far, we've just talked about the bulk, but of course, you know that boundary states are, are something that's that's everywhere in topology, and um, and there is a neat way to see why this spectral flow uh, directly and this uh, property that the Wilson loop is related to the position operator directly tells you if you have uh, non-trivial topology in the bulk that's detected by the Wilson loop spectrum, um, you also find boundary states. And for that, um, so let's say bulk boundary correspondence. For that, we can um, look at the system where in the x direction, we have, uh, we do something to our system, do a domain wall and in the, in the other directions, we leave, the, leave it in peace. So we wanna do the following. We want to, uh, we have some Hamiltonian that we are interested in and uh, we are actually going to uh, flatten this Hamiltonian spectrally so that we don't have to deal with dispersions and so on. Um, so that uh, k flat um, is going to be one minus two times this projector that we know and love, and the projector is the same as above. And, uh, and so we want to define a system where the Hamiltonian on the very left is just a constant, just the identity matrix. So it means that all the states are at some finite energy one. And on the very right, um, we want to use this uh, flattened Hamiltonian of the system that we are interested in. And we want to now show that there are boundary states. So, so the system is basically this kind of part. And now uh, we want to show that there are boundary states. Okay. Um, well, that's uh, the premise. And a simple idea is that we use the following interpolation between this situation and one that we know. So we want to define a family of Hamiltonians. Um, first of all, to define, to, 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 to uh, describe the situation, we use the following Hamiltonian. We use some potential V of X that um, describes the situation. I'll define it shortly. Um, so V of X is given by one for X less than zero and minus one for X larger than zero. And you see, uh, quickly check that these two limits that I promised, they are exactly happening. So if it's, um, if it's one, then this P uh, cancels out. And if it's minus one, then they, they add up and you get exactly this flat band Hamiltonian. And, um, and the point is now, uh, uh, we want to deform this interpolated Hamiltonian. And I'm only going to do this pictorially, but we can also you know, do this with formulas. So um, initially we start off with a V of X uh, that is sharp, like I defined it here, this is V zero. And then um, we can um, go to a situation where we make like a linear slope in the middle, and we raise this uh, these plateaus a little bit. Um, so, uh, so in here, uh, this this v of x uh, becomes like alpha times x, or you know minus alpha times x with some um, uh, with some slope. And then we go further, and eventually um, we um, have just the linear slope. V of X is equal to X. And uh, from what we know already, we can basically infer what the spectrum uh, will be. So um, on the very left side, and I'm, I'm going to draw the spectrum a little bit uh, uh, weirdly now. Um, let, me, let me do it like that. Uh, so we do um, a red side and then we have uh, let's say a yellow side. Um, what is the spectrum on the, on the red end? Um, and I mean, we have, if, if we, for instance, uh, look at the churn insulator, 
Oh no, it doesn't matter now for now. What is the spectrum on the, on the red end? On the red end, we have, um, uh, okay, this is, let me put energy this way and K because, um, uh, because I had the K going upwards before. Um, so that is from minus pi to pi. On the red side, every, all the states that are at energy plus one, right? So the spectrum will look like this. On the yellow side, the spectrum will be such that half of the states are in the uh, upper band and half are in the lower band, right? We have this flat band projected Hamiltonian. So the spectrum will look like this, okay. Now let's go to the other extreme case. What about the very right? I believe uh, I can convince you that also here we know the spectrum. Um, why? Because this is just the position operator, the projected position operator. Yeah? If V of X is, is, is X, uh, the rest is kind of trivial, um, then this spectrum here, we know it. Um, so the spectrum will look, uh, you know, will have these, this binding. And of course, again, it will, um, you know, there's no way to topologically take these, uh, these paths apart, right? Um, they, they need to be connected because K, uh, K is periodic from uh, minus pi to, between minus pi to pi because it's a Brillouin zone. So, um, so in this process of deforming the potential from a linear slope to the step potential, um, what can happen to this, uh, to this spectrum really? We can just squish a bunch of these states together, but the fact that all of the states are connected like a necklace, we cannot change. And so we can infer that the final spectrum that we get here will also have to look like this. Yeah? So there need to be states at the boundary which connect through the entire, you know, the, the, the empty and the occupied band. Yeah? So just it's a kind of a smooth deformation. Um, and, and this deformation cannot uh, break the topological flow, let's say. And, and for that reason, um, we have boundary states. We have to have boundary states. And of course, the example that I, uh, uh, that I drew here is the churn insulator. Okay. Um, so, uh, this was um, the chapter one of four of my plan. Um, I am, however, happy to stop here uh, because it's a really very natural break. Um, I know I still have like five minutes, but I think it would be a bit of a rush to start a new chapter and I can get to a meaningful end tomorrow as well. Is that okay with our chair or should, I mean, I can also go on for another maybe 15 minutes to get something meaningful, but I think that's, I don't no, know. I think, I think it's okay, Titus. Uh, um, maybe also in this way, we can spare a couple of other minutes if somebody has any question. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed very much all the questions, by the way. So keep, uh, yeah, keep doing I, that. Yeah. During the during the lecture, I think it's it's really good that I helps me also to see that that is uh, some some people are following. Very motivating. All right, good. Then maybe let me just uh, you know uh, wrap up by saying that um, what we've looked at today is a quantity that we can compute for bulk systems. Um, so we have periodic boundary conditions in x and y direction. This is the Wilson loop. Um, it's a gauge invariant. Uh, it has a gauge invariant spectrum. And uh, so it's relatively easy to compute. It, uh, you know, we don't need any smooth gauge or anything like that. And uh, we've basically been relating this quantity that we can compute in the bulk uh, to two different things. One is actually three different things in a way. One is the uh, topological invariance. So we've, at the example of the churn number, seen that, uh, you know, the, the Wilson loop and the churn number are, are in a 
or the, the binding of the Wilson loop. So some topological property of the Wilson loop spectrum is in direct correspondence uh, to the turn number. And that's uh, the same for other topological invariants. That's part one. Part two, we saw that the spectrum of the Wilson loop of this quantity to do with topology is uh, very closely related to the spectrum of the uh, projected position operator. And um, the third thing, we use this relation to the real space to position operator to actually show that um, there's a topological bulk boundary correspondence. Whenever there is a flow in the Wilson loop spectrum, so that maybe I should sort of say, yeah, right, topological flow in the Wilson loop spectrum, I have a boundary that does not break the symmetry that you know, protects this flow, then I also have to have uh, on this you know, even boundary, I have to have topological boundary modes. So now there is another question from Alexandra. Let me first answer this one. Is it easy to see in this interpolation picture that the number of surface states equals the churn number? Yes. So, um, yes. So, so um, as we said before, the churn number is equal to the number of states that tr transverse this. Um, um uh, any cut really any cut yeah um of course there could we have to count um uh, you know with taking the, the the sign of the fermi velocity into account so if we have a state that does this it counts as uh, plus one minus one plus one so the sum is one so turn number would be one yeah so there could be these kind of accidental boundary states also jen was mentioning this quite a lot um, but, uh, you know, if you kind of count properly, then you, you know that there needs to be, um, uh, you know, a single or an odd number of crossings or maybe, no, a number of crossings, if you count them the sign that equals the churn number at every energy. But of course, it doesn't tell you whether a state does this here or whether you just have one state that's doing doing this over the breathing zone. And that's a non-universal thing that, the, you know, between these two situations, you could go by changing the boundary conditions a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then um, Martin asks, uh, in previous slides, you defined the churn number as the winding of the Wilson loop using a single band example. If we had a non-abelian case, could the winding of some bands cancel the winding of the others leading to C equal to zero despite having winding? So, um, Good question. Let me try to, uh, to to sketch what you have. So let's say two bands. That's probably the the simplest case. Um, and again, uh, I, I have this winding. So there's one band. Uh, let's say that does this, or do a bit more. Nah. One band that does this, and from another band, I get uh, let's say the opposite winding. Then the the point is, yes, there are these two windings. The total churn number would be zero. And now we have to see, this would be a construction if these bands are completely detached. But um, we have to always think of putting every possible perturbation that's symmetry allowed. And such a perturbation would in general couple these bands. And then the Wilson loop um, would, would basically look like this. And then there's no winding anymore. So, um, so what you're saying is right. These bands mutually cancel each other's winding. There's no need, you know, need for winding anymore in this case. Uh, now, uh, anonymous uh, attendee asks, uh, could you show the connection between the symmetry of the Wilson loop and the churn number in materials? Um, so the churn number, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the question aims at. There are certain constraints that uh, provide you with uh, uh, const or conclusions about the churn number. For instance, uh, if you have inversion symmetry and an odd number of bands have inversion eigenvalue minus one, you are bound to have an odd, uh, or like, yeah, the, the, the inversion eigenvalues of all bands um, over all 
high symmetry points, all inversion symmetric points are, are minus one, then the Tron number is odd. Um, now seeing that, and I'm, for instance, interpreting the question as to what would happen in such a case, do you have a constraint that relates these two facts? I'm, uh, I'm not sure I can demonstrate that offhand. Um, let me think, if I come up with something nice, I can do that tomorrow. Okay, I think Oscar has a question. I did have a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if um, you were to pick uh, your path for the Wilson loop to be contractible versus non-contractible, do you see a difference? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so on a non-contractible path, I can make these topological statements about the uh, binding um, of the Wilson loop in a contractible path you would never have any topological signature, I would say, Very good. for definition, because you can pull it together to nothing and right. then you just have, yeah, uh, unless you have symmetries that, um, yeah, no, no, let me just stop there, yeah, yeah. So, so that very first loop you drew, I should be thinking about it as non-contractible. As non-contractible, I mean, you know, it, yeah, this was just like a general definition of the Wilson loop. So the Wilson loop is well-defined right. on any right. closed loop. But, uh, but it's for topological detection of anything, it's absolutely not meaningful. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So it's important that by straight path is, is a non-contractable one. It doesn't need to be straight necessarily, but it should be non-contractable for these topological things. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Very nice. Well, that closed the question session. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. I think it's great that there is. Oh, maybe not. Uh, should I take this one last one? Okay, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, uh, so it's always protected. It's always protected the Wilson loop winding. I believe that you only distinguish the parity of the winding, but not the number. For example, you know that general parity of the winding number you don't can you can't distinguish between c equal to one and three. Um, so this parity thing is for these inversion eigenvalues. The Wilson loop winding for the turn number, for instance, is is uh, giving you the full information. So in a turn insulator. Uh, with turn number three, um, you would really, if, if this is like your unit cell, you would have, oh, that's not, I didn't draw that very nicely. You can have, oh, oh, let's do two with maybe then I'm not so much in trouble. So you could have this, for instance, that would be a turn number two uh, winding, telling you uh, that's told by, by looking at any cut, counting, you know, with a sign, how many crossings you have, and that is, there's no way to remove that. So it's it's not just the parity, it's the full churn number. And in general, the full topological invariance that you would get from that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, so. All right, so let's uh, move on. Thank you very much, Titus, for, for this uh, very pedagogical talk. We there will be, I guess, plenty of room for questions in your next lecture tomorrow. Okay, very so, good. Thanks. Uh, now we have the second lecture of today, which is the second uh, part of the lecture by Oscar Bafek about correlations and topology in uh, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. So, Oscar, whenever you you want, please share your screen. Thank you. Um, a second. Um, okay, um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so this is where we stopped uh, last time. Let me just remind you um, that um, we are thinking about now just the narrow bands in the twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, we have renormalized uh, down to just this Hilbert space. Um, and we argue that, uh, well, the bands are still narrow and the Coulomb interaction is going to dominate um, the, uh, let's see, the Coulomb interaction is going to dominate um, the kinetic energy, the renormalized kinetic energy. Uh, there are certain statements we can make about this, uh, namely uh, at the charge neutrality point, uh, any, body, any many body state that's annihilated by this uh, fluctuation density operator delta rho is going to be a ground state because the uh, repulsive interaction is positive semi-definite. 
Um, and so if we can zero something out, it's gotta be a ground state. Um, it's a little bit trickier at um, even integer filling away from the neutrality point, but nevertheless, there are certain statements one can make about this. Um, namely, if you can find an eigenstate, uh, many body eigenstate uh, of delta rho, uh, which is not actually that difficult at even integer filling, you just simply fill, um, you know, for example, a particular uh, valley with a particular spin, um, uh, such a state uh, is going to be an eigenstate of this, uh, and this energy is actually pretty decent. It turns out to be a ground state. You can check this numerically. Um, there is also a deformation of this Hamiltonian into so-called uh, flat metric uh, condition in which this can actually be shown to be the ground state. And as you move away this uh, deformation, um, you can check numerically that uh, it remains a, a ground state. And this was done in this uh, very nice series of papers uh, by Andre's group. Uh, but the, uh, this flat metric condition uh, was sort of uh, discovered uh, uh, in real space in this uh, uh, first paper uh, in this list. Um, now at odd integer filling, um, it's harder to make uh, exact statements um, unless uh, we have both the flat metric condition and also if the cell lattice is perfectly polarized, such as we are in the um, uh, chiral limit, uh, in this case, the churn states will be the ground states. Um, and again, you can try to deform from this and ask, uh, um, you know, how far does this survive? Uh, this was also done numerically in this uh, very nice series of papers. Um, and it survives up to a certain ratio of W0 to W1 um, and um, uh, and uh, without the flat metric condition. But, but then as I will show you, it will actually uh, go away uh, when W0 over W1 is close to 0.8, which is believed to be the realistic value so that there we will get actually a larger degeneracy uh, of states. But in any case, um, one way or another, we see that these generalized ferromagnets are favored by the projected Coulomb interaction. Uh, in real space, this was first shown in this uh, 2019 paper. Um, uh, and there was an explanation for this, namely you show how the famous super exchange um, that we know in the Hubbard model um, is defeated. Um, because of the longer range uh, nature of the Vanier states and the projected Coulomb interaction. In fact, it favors direct uh, uh, ferromagnetic exchange uh, among the sites. Um, but you can also study this uh, in different bases. And uh, in particular, you can go to momentum space, uh, so block bases, or you can go to hybrid Vanier bases, um, or you can go to 2D exponential localized uh, bases, as we will uh, discuss today. Okay, um, so now, um, so it's very simple to construct. So let, let's think for a moment, just pedagogically, that we are back at the charge neutrality point. So that all we have to do is find a state that is annihilated by this delta rho. Uh, that's not difficult to do. Uh, for example, a valley polarized state will do. If you put uh, at the charge neutrality point, all the electrons, uh, let's say, into valley k prime and leave valley k empty. Um, delta rho uh, uh, will annihilate such a state. But this is not the only state um, because, uh, which, which is uh, the ground state at the charge neutrality point for this Hamiltonian. Um, and that's because there is a uh, larger uh, global symmetry in this strong coupling limit, uh, namely the spin value U for symmetry. Um, and the way to understand this is as follows. Um, the particle hole symmetry I mentioned yesterday um, allows us to relate a state um, in the narrow bands whose kinetic energy would be uh, uh, sketched over here. So there'd be some E and K. So N is the uh, band label. And if you give me such a state within the narrow band within a particular valley, uh, then I can immediately generate a state uh, which is at uh, kind of a reflected K point uh, relative to this with the negative of that energy. Um, and I can do that by complex conjugation, um, uh, flipping the sublattice, so sigma X acts in the sublattice, um, and at the same time uh, acting with um, I mu Y, so mu Y is the uh, Y Pauli matrix acting in the layer space. Okay, so, so this operation is gonna take you between uh, these two branches. Uh, of the uh, narrow band spectrum, okay? And it turns out 
Uh, so, so think my x here, x on the subathis. And so it turns out that now, if you take the projected, de projected density operator, which is now explicitly over here, it will have the following form. Um, so uh, the upper two components live in a valley K, okay? They um, are labeled by their band index, which is plus for the upper branch, minus for the lower branch. Um, and uh, since this is at a position R, uh, you know, we're going to be in general mixing uh, K and K prime over here. And, and the, the product of the wave functions is going to be sitting um, in these uh, A, B, C, D coefficients. Now, um, it turns out that because of this particle hole symmetry, we can relate the coefficients um, in the valley K to the coefficients in the valley K prime. Uh, such as this, um, and this shows you that this um, four by four matrix in the uh, in the um, in the valley and band space, uh, you see the spin is sort of uh, just riding along. Um, uh, clearly commutes with these four. Uh, other four by four matrices. So let me just uh, walk you through this. So the first one is trivial, it's just an identity. The second one is um, tau z, tau act in the uh, valley space and the identity acts in the band space, okay? So clearly this is, this is fine because uh, we don't have any coupling between the two valleys in the density operator. So uh, there's no, uh, this should be obvious why um, the second uh, four by four matrix commutes with this uh, uh, larger four by four matrix. Um, and what this just corresponds to is simply independent spin uh, rotations uh, within each valley. Okay? But if, uh, if this is all that there is to it, then the symmetry would only be U2 cross U2, which is actually the symmetry of the Bissett and McDonald model. However, the projected Coulomb interactions uh, have a larger symmetry. Um, and that's because there is another pair of four by four Pauli matrices. Uh, again, tau acting in the valley, sigma tilde acting in the band in this particular case, which also commute with this four by four matrix. And now, because we are changing the valleys, we are able to uh, rotate uh, continuously between them. Okay, so this will be the generators. Um, and so this actually is even larger in the chiral limit because there's a basis in which the coefficients B and C uh, will go to zero and then the whole thing is just diagonal. And in that case, uh, the symmetry is not only U4, it's actually U4 cross U4. So in every churn basis, uh, you can perform uh, these rotations independently. And so what this means is that if you find a ground state for the uh, projected interaction Hamiltonian at the charge neutrality point, let's say, then I can generate a manifold of states, depending on whether you're in a chiral limit or not. If you're not in a chiral limit, I can generate a manifold of uh, uh, states by a global spin value for rotations. And, and this is interesting because some of these states uh, contain, for example, equal superposition between uh, having an electron in, in valley K and valley K prime. And these are so-called intervalley coherent states. Now, if you're in a higher limit, uh, you can actually uh, perform other rotations, which will, for example, take this valley polarized state um, and turn it into, um, um, uh, well, you can show that it is degenerate with, uh, for example, a churn state. So, so even though it is a generalized ferromagnet, uh, it, it's not necessarily just a spin ferromagnet. There, there are uh, other states within this manifold, okay? So, uh, so that's, the, that's the new uh, result on the strong coupling limit. We should be thinking about this as this generalized ferromagnet. And uh, as you see, it's very different from what would happen in a Hubbard model. In an ordinary Hubbard model, um, the degeneracy would be much larger um, in a strong coupling limit without introducing any hopping, 
then uh, let's say you are at half filling of a square lattice Hubbard model. You have one electron per site with the spin that can point up and down, um, but that spin is independent on each site. So your degeneracy would be exponential, two to the power of number of sites. Um, in this case, the degeneracy is nowhere near that large. The degeneracy is really just global rotation, so it's polynomial in the number of sites. And the reason for the degeneracy being much smaller compared to the usual uh, Hubbard model is actually the extended nature of the, uh, let's say, uh, 2D localized Banyan states. Uh, you can see this in momentum space as well, but I think it's clear in the um, exponentially localized uh, basis. If you were to project the interaction onto this, you wouldn't get just the Hubbard model. You would get intersite exchanges, you would get um, assisted hopping terms, you would get pair hopping terms. And so they sort of propagate um, uh, the information, uh, they, they link various sites in a way that the ordinary Hubbard model does not, uh, already at the level of the interaction before you ever brought back any kinetic energy. So that's the reason for lifting of this uh, massive degeneracy that you would naively have gotten in the ordinary Hubbard model. Um, okay, so, so as I mentioned, uh, one example of such a state would be a valley polarized state. It's a ground state, but in fact, uh, any state that can be obtained from valley polarized state by spin valley U4 rotation is also a ground state. Um, now, um, let's stick with the charge neutrality point. We'll discuss um, the other integer fillings uh, uh, later. Um, it turns out that um, we can also build exact excitation spectra on top of these ground states. So why is that? So usually, um, you know, this is a difficult numerical problem. It's a many body problem. But in this particular case, there's a simplification. And the key observation, which was actually made independently uh, by us and by Andre's group, um, is that because the state upon which this fluctuation density operator acts is annihilated by it at the charge neutrality point, when I take delta rho, delta rho, and I act on a state, which was the ground state, but then I have some operator X acting on that state. So let's say that X will try to create an excitation on top of our uh, ground state. And naively, it looks like a complicated problem. It's a, a V delta rho, delta rho. But the simplification comes from the fact that when you bring the delta rho all the way to the right, um, then uh, omega gets annihilated by it. And therefore, you can re rewrite every product of delta rho x as a commutator of delta rho x. So that's the first term. And of course, you can continue doing this. Now you would have a delta rho times a commutator. But again, because delta rho annihilates omega, you can write it as a commutator. Now, what does this buy you? Well, what it buys you is the fact that now imagine for a second that x is just a uh, creation or annihilation operator. So you're trying to create single particle excitation. So let's count. Um, delta rho is going to contain one creation operator and one annihilation operator. Uh, let's say x is a creation operator. Well, this commutator is going to um, return another creation operator. It's not going to return uh, two creation operators and one annihilation operator. It's just going to return one creation operator. OK? Um, and then if you make another commutator uh, with another creation annihilation, with a creation operator, again, you only have one creation operator left. You won't get this additional particle hall excitations, which usually would happen. Um, and so that means that on the right-hand side of the equation, you are left with some convolution in real space of just a single creation operator. But uh, um, uh, that means that you can solve an eigenproblem because uh, you would have an energy times creation operator uh, uh, acting on the ground state. So on the left-hand side, you just have a creation operator. On the right-hand side, you have some convolution of a creation operator. And so you're dealing with a one-body problem. Okay. So now you just have to diagonalize uh, a simple matrix. In fact, um, because this is a translation symmetry, you can take advantage of that. And all you have to diagonalize really 
is just a, a small matrix, in fact, just two by two matrix um, uh, within uh, uh, for, for each K point. And then you get exact excitation spectra on top of this. Okay, so there's no approximation here. All the approximations were already stated. Uh, namely, we're going to uh, ignore the kinetic energy um, and start by building the many body spectra of the projected uh, Coulomb interactions. Um, and so uh, you can go from the top equation to the bottom equation simply by matching the uh, operator content on the left and the operator content on the right. Now, to understand the degeneracy, you also need a little, a little bit more. You need to know whether your creation operator is, for example, trying to uh, add into a field state, in which case it's really annihilating it itself. Um, but then you, ha you have to do kind of a posteriori. But in any case, uh, let's say you went through this procedure and you did this. Um, so these delta rho operators, they contain um, the wave functions that we have left after the, um, uh, after the projection, after the RG. And there's going to be some convolution of four of these wave functions. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let's say let's say we now match uh, left and right and solve the eigenvalue problem. Um, what we find is the following: at the charge neutrality point for the results of the RG that I showed you before for the wave functions, we find that adding a single particle or single hole to the problem um, is gapped. So all the states that I showed you. Uh, that belong to this U4 manifold are gapped. Um, so they're insulating states. Um, that's not so surprising because uh, we solved the strong coupling problem. But, and, and of course, and, and the size of the gap is set by the Coulomb scale, which is uh, set by the dielectric constant of the environment um, and the Moret period, LM. But the surprising or the more interesting part is that even in strong coupling, so I have not brought back any kinetic energy at this point, the excitations disperse. In other words, and the dispersion, if you look here, is actually comparable to the gap itself. Now, so in other words, what this means is that this is very, very different from what would happen in a Hubbard model in strong coupling limit. In a Hubbard model in strong coupling, when you are, let's say, at the half filling, you can try to add a particle um, to a fully filled lattice. That's going to cost you a Hubbard U. OK, good. That's a gap state. That's similar to this. But that particle would just sit there. If you want to move that particle around, you have to bring back the kinetic energy, which comes in perturbatively. And through second order processes, in principle, you could move at excitation. However, as you see here, without ever bringing in kinetic energy as a perturbation, our excitation moves. And in fact, its dispersion is itself set by the Coulomb interaction. Now that's a new aspect of this problem. How is this happening? Well, it's happening because the projected Coulomb interaction, um, again, contains terms which uh, describe, for example, assisted hopping, or they describe pair hopping. And these terms are able to delocalize your excitation even in strong coupling. And that, as we showed in this um, 2019 paper with Jian, um, is actually a direct consequence of uh, the non-trivial topology of the narrow band. So the fact that the way that the uh, Vanier states in 2D, 2D localized Vanier states um, uh, have this extended uh, nature. I will discuss that as we as we go along. So this is the first. Kind of an interesting thing. So now, of course, you can start asking, well, what would happen if I start adding excitations to this strong coupling problem? Well, um, uh, presumably, they would want to go into the vicinity of gamma point. Uh, and we will, we will discuss this as, as, as we go along. Um, now, notice that this dispersion is extremely different. It's very different from the dispersion you would have gotten from the Business and McDonald model. In the Business and McDonald model, you have two narrow bands. And these two narrow bands touch uh, at k and nk prime points in the uh, more brittle one zone. Here, the dispersion is gapped. These two bands uh, touch at gamma. Okay, They touch at m. And they also touch at k and k prime. But the shape of this is very, very different. The minima are at gamma. They're definitely uh, uh, you know, not going to k or k prime points. 
Okay. So um, we can build other excitation using this technique. Uh, you know, nobody tells me that I should choose this operator X to be creation or annihilation operator. I can, but I can choose this X to be particle hall operator. So D dagger D type operator. And again, the same logic goes through delta rho annihilates on the right. So I can continue thinking about this as a commutator. And this just becomes a nested commutator. Uh, you know, the operator content on the right does not change. If I'm going to have a D dagger D on the left, I'm going to get some convolved, but still just D dagger D on the right. I won't pick up any other operators. And so again, I can close this system of equations um, and just diagonalize. I mean, in this case, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a larger matrix to diagonalize, but you can still do this on your laptop. Um, and so in this particular case, I'm going to show you the spectra we obtained uh, for the neutral collective excitations at the charge neutrality. So again, it's, it's a spectra of a D dagger D operator added to uh, these exact uh, charge neutrality point uh, ground states. So um, first, notice that the red line here is the onset of the particle hole continuum that you can obtain simply by matching, by thinking about the kinematics of single particle excitation, just from this blue curve. Okay? So everything above this red line is part of a continuum. Below this continuum, we see bound states, particle hole bound states. And in particular, we see a set of branches uh, at uh, energies which are significantly removed from the rest of the states, which form our low lying collective modes. Now, um, what are these modes? So we see that there is a quadratically vanishing. A collective mode at the gamma point, that's a ferromagnetic ghost dome. Okay, you know that uh, 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 ferromagnets have um, uh, Heisenberg ferromagnets would have a uh, 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 quadratically dispersing uh, ghost component. So we see this explicitly in this calculation. But then, in addition to that, we see that there is another mode which softens. Now, that softening has to do with our flowing closer to the chiral limit. Because in the chiral limit, the U4 symmetry that I discussed enlarges to U4 cross U4. And so softening of this mode is a signature of the proximity to the chiral limit. This is the so-called pseudo Goldstone mode. And then in addition to, yeah, so, so the gap here uh, is about uh, 0.2 uh, in the Coulomb units. So this tells you a little bit about how much of an, an isotropy you have um, uh, for different churn sectors. Okay, and then finally, there is this uh, rather interesting low-lying branch, which uh, does not become um, gapless in the chiral limit, but nevertheless, um, it's still rather soft compared to the rest. And I don't know if you can see this, but there are actually two branches which cross here. Um, so there's actually um, a symmetry enforced uh, crossing uh, of these collective modes at the gamma point. And they transform under a, a non trivial representation for the threefold rotation. So these are actually the pneumatic collective modes in the system. Um, OK. Now. What can we use this for, apart from what I just mentioned, as a physical interpretation? Well, imagine we sit at the gamma point. Well, that means that we have the exact wave functions and the exact energies of any charge neutral uh, operator of the form D dagger D, um, uh, whose total momentum is zero. That means we can take the kinetic energy of whose momentum is also zero, and decompose it as a linear combination of the operators we have at the gamma point. And that means we can do an exact super exchange calculation. We can, we can now go to second order perturbation theory, act on our ground states with the kinetic energy operator. We know how to decompose it into the exact uh, eigenstates, eigenoperators of the Hamiltonian and the gamma. Um, and um, 
And instead of just putting a bound on the super exchange, so the effect of the kinetic energy, uh, we can just compute this exactly. Okay. And this was done in uh, in here uh, as a function of the twist angle. So the blue line here shows the charge gap, and the red curve shows this super exchange. So super exchange is is in quotes because this is this is sort of the, the, the manifold is ferromagnetic of this generalized kind, but then the kinetic energy, um, which uh, itself does not have a full U4 symmetry, only U2 cross U2, is going to try to introduce some anisotropies here. Okay. Now, this anisotropy has been argued to be good for superconductivity um, by um, proponents of the skirmion mediated superconductivity. Uh, but as you see, so in other words, in that theory, as J goes up, TC would go up. But as you see, this J is actually minimum at the magic angle. While I showed you previously data uh, from experiments which showed that the TC has a maximum at the magic angle. So, so in any case, the point I'm trying to make here, uh, additional point I'm trying to make here, is that um, we can find out how large is this super exchange. Okay. So, for example, in a Hubbard model, the way you would do that uh, again is you would bring egg, you would bring back the hopping. Um, you would treat the hopping in second order perturbation theory. And then you would ask, uh, is this J that you generate uh, large uh, or small? If it's too large compared to the charge gap, um, well, then you may want to start uh, suspecting that your um, uh, strong coupling limit um, is not that well justified. But as you see here at the magic angle, the super exchange is very small. Uh, so in Coulomb units, uh, its its minimum takes this value, um, and so in fact this is the justification for uh, taking the strong coupling limit in the last step. Okay, uh, whatever kinetic energy uh, is left, uh, it's just a perturbation uh, uh, trying to split this uh, u4 or maybe even u4 cross u4 manifold. Um, okay. Now um, I would like to go back to this spectrum and try to understand why it has the shape it has. Why does it have a minimum at gamma, for example? Um, and how will it depend on the screening due to the metallic gates of the Coulomb interaction? So for example, if I imagine a system which has one gate above and one gate below symmetrically placed uh, um, around the twisted bilayer graphene, uh, and I could imagine that I can change this distance, um, then the long range part of the Coulomb interaction will be screened uh, more if I bring the gates closer. I'd like to understand what happens to this spectrum. Okay, So to do that, um, uh, let me go back through the derivation and uh, actually generalize this so that we are not just at the charge neutrality point, uh, but we can be at any integer filling. Uh, but I'm going to uh, simplify uh, our life a little bit and go to the chiral limit. If we understand it in the chiral limit, uh, we can do the numerics away from the chiral limit. Um, and we'll see that while there are some changes, they are not um, going to change the fact that we uh, can actually understand where these changes come from. So again, um, uh, it's basically the same idea, except for now, since we are at integer filling, delta rho no longer annihilates uh, our ground state, but um, it turns out that when delta rho acts on our states, as I mentioned, um, the ground states turn out to be eigenstates of delta rho. And so in this case, you just replace the result of the action of this operator onto the ground state with a C number function that is written over here. Uh, and again, it does not change. Uh, and which can be written in terms of the uh, exact um, uh, narrow band wave functions. Um, and so again, it doesn't change the operator count. Uh, the number of operators on the left uh, 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 of this equation and on the right of this equation um, are the same. And so you don't really have to solve a hard many body problem. You're only really just solving a few body problems. Um, so if you go through this, you notice an interesting thing. Uh, namely, uh, let, let's consider just single particle excitation. So we would substitute 
either the annihilation operator for x or the creation operator for the x. Now, the first equation, uh, the, 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 the first term on the right-hand side of this equation does not care um, whether you have a creation or an annihilation operator because you do the commutator twice. But this term, which is present only if you are away from the charge neutrality, actually does care. Because think about this delta rho, it's something like d dagger d. Now, if this x is d, then you're going to get plus d dagger as a result of this commutator. On the other hand, if this x is, um, so, so the first one is d dagger. So, so if this x is now d, and you have a d dagger d commuting with d, then it's going to be minus d. So you've got a different sign depending on whether you're adding a particle to the ground state uh, at a non-zero integer filling, or whether you are taking a particle away. And this will be very important for us as we go along. In any case, um, uh, the, the result of this operator matching can be written uh, uh, through our exact wave functions. These are block functions labeled by um, the band index n and the uh, uh, block momentum k. Um, and these sums over the band indices are only over the narrow bands we've already projected. Okay. Um, so we can think about the first term as being an exchange term, and we can think about the second term as being the direct or the hard tree term. Uh, but I want to stress that this is exact. This is not a hartree fock approximation, uh, which would not be justified by any uh, other theoretical reasons. This is just an exact calculation. All right. Uh, and so uh, in principle, I could just plug in the numerically determined wave functions and uh, compute this numerically and just report the result. But I wouldn't necessarily understand it. So uh, I'm trying to. Um, uh, actually explain why the spectrum looks the way it does. Um, now, it turns out that in the chiral limit, you can show that this uh, matrix in N and M at every K is diagonal. And the reason for this is a combination of uh, two symmetries. The first one is so-called chiral particle hole symmetry, which is a, a symmetry that's present in the chiral limit, uh, in addition to the C2T symmetry that has been discussed uh, uh, previously. So um, now um, uh, let me first report the result of this calculation. Um, so if we were to take away a particle, let's say at positive integer filling, um, then as I mentioned, uh, one of these terms subtracts, so this, this let's call it hard tree like term, subtracts from the Fock term. Well, if we were to add a particle, uh, then it adds. And so now all we have to do is figure out what these dispersions are independently for the exchange and for the hard tree part. Um, now, we're going to uh, allow, as I mentioned, uh, a additional parameter in our problem, namely the distance to the two screening layers. So in other words, physically what we are thinking about is that our twisted bilayer graphene, which is sandwiched in the hexagonal boronitride layers, um, has a metallic gate above and below. And let's just say it's symmetrically above and below. Uh, and the distance um, that the metallic gate uh, has above our twisted bilayer is uh, denoted by this Greek letter C. And so then just from your um, elementary uh, electrostatics course, um, you know that there would be a series of image charges that occur for any test charge in the twisted bilayer graphene uh, due to these uh, uh, metallic layers. Um, and if you just had one, you would have a dipole problem. Um, uh, if you just had one uh, gate, but because you have two, uh, now they start mirror reflecting and you get this infinite series of charge. Now you can, it turns out you can set, sum up this series. Uh, you can look at it in real space, you can look at it in momentum space. In real space, what happens is that the interaction is exponentially small, um, as opposed to just the dipole interaction, um, at distances uh, larger than xi, at distances much shorter than xi, the interaction is still one over r. So uh, in momentum space, um, that interaction has the following form. It's the standard Coulomb piece, uh, which I discussed below, uh, before, but now it has this additional factor of hyperbolic tangent, uh, uh, q xi divided by two. Okay. Okay, 
so I'm going to plot um, the dispersion contribution from the exchange term first on the left that's shown over here um, as a function of the distance of the metallic screening layers to the twisted bilayer graph. And again, LM is the Moray period. So what we see is that this exchange term um, has sort of similar shape, almost the same shape, even though we are moving the gates further and further apart from the twisted bilayer, um, but that the gap is actually changing, the gap grows. So that should not be super surprising that the gap is growing because uh, after all, uh, we are changing the strength of the Coulomb uh, repulsion um, as we are moving the gates further apart and we're making it stronger. Um, so indeed the gap is growing as we are moving the gates further apart. But why is the shape not changing? And why is the minimum at gamma? That's not obvious because the entire dispersion curve is set by the Coulomb interaction. Um, so, so that's the uh, that's this epsilon f uh, term in the chiral limit. Again, I just want to stress that uh, we haven't brought back any kinetic energy here. This is all strong coupling, single particle excitation, and as you see, even in the chiral limit, the single particle excitation disperses. So for now, I want you to focus on just the the solid lines, which are a result of a calculation in the block basis. Um, the dots are actually calculation performed by banyarizing this problem, which I will discuss in just a second. And as you see, there's a perfect degree. So you definitely can banyarize this problem in 2D. So 2D localized. Now, um, the heartbeat contribution, the direct uh, term, um, is plotted on the right here. Uh, again, it has a minimum at gamma. Uh, its width is set by the Coulomb interaction. Um, but notice it has almost no dependence on how far I put away the gates, as long as the gates are at least one Moray wavelength away from the twisted bilayer graph, so one and above. So there is a big difference between uh, the Hartree contribution and the exchange contribution uh, in that dependence on uh, in the dependence on xi, the distance to the gate. Okay, now. If you look at the actual numbers, you notice that the bandwidth is almost the same for the curve on the right uh, and the curve on the left. It's about half a Coulomb unit, maybe just a little bit less. Now, also the shape is almost the same, okay? Um, so you can see what's going to happen if we are at mu equal to one. So uh, because the strength of the term that we are adding or subtracting depends uh, from the heart tree, depends on the filling, at mu equal to one, um, if we add a hole to the system, then there will be a cancellation of this dispersion from the exchange part and this dispersion from the heart tree part. And in fact, our excitation will be almost completely flat. The band for the holes at mu equal to one will be almost completely flat. On the other hand, for the particle at mu equal to one, the, true, the two curves will add and the bandwidth will double. So we'll see a huge asymmetry um, between the particle and hole. And of course, if you were to go to the mu equal to minus one filling, this will all get inverted. In other words, trying to add an excitation that would, that would move our filling closer to the charge neutrality point is going to flatten out the spectrum at mu equal to one or mu equal to minus one. But if the excitation is moving the filling um, away from the charge neutrality point, so towards the remote bands, then in fact, the bandwidth grows. Um, if we were at mu equal to two, then in fact, we have to add two of these or subtract two of these curves on the right from the left curve, and then the dispersion will invert. Uh, and again, there will be a huge asymmetry because adding a hole at mu equal to two will mean that the hole is going to go into these flat portions uh, of the dispersion, while the particle is still happily going to go to the minimum uh, at the gamma point, which is nice and deep. Um, 
And in my opinion, uh, this is the explanation for the cascade transitions, as I will try to argue. Okay, so we're gonna now uh, switch the basis. Instead of describing this in a block basis, which we certainly can, we can describe this in a churn basis as well, block churn basis, um, and do the calculations numerically, we're going to try to vanierize this problem. Now, you can object, you can say, well, how can you vanierize this problem? It's topological. Well, um, you need to remember, I think uh, Titus mentioned this as well, really the only obstruction to 2D vanierization is if you have a non-zero churn number. Now, even within each valley, as I showed you from the Wilson loops in a previous lecture, the churn numbers of the two bands are opposite. So we have a one plus and one minus. As Andre said, it's, a little, it's more like a quantum spin hole problem than it is like a churn insulator problem. Now that is topological, but the total churn number vanishes. What this means is that strictly, if all you're after is finding a 2D exponential localized vanier states, it can be done. There is no obstruction to building 2D exponential localized vanier states. Now, there is an obstruction to also demanding that the symmetries which made this problem topological are implemented in some simple on-site fashion. And that part will have to get sacrificed. By the way, it doesn't actually mean that you break symmetries, as is usually stated in the literature, that in order to be able to localize a topological band without churn numbers, um, you have to break symmetries. Uh, because the mapping between the uh, Vanier basis and the block basis uh, is unitary. There's no information that can get lost. So rather, the more correct statement is that the symmetries are not manifest, but the symmetries are still there if you do this mapping exactly. In any case, um, in this particular case, if we do this in a chiral limit, um, as was done uh, in detail in this paper, so I encourage you to read the papers, in, particularly if you want to see how the symmetries are implemented and which symmetries cannot be implemented in a simple um, uh, site to site fashion, in particular, C to T in here is not. But I think it was a question uh, during one of the Andre's lectures. How about particle hole symmetry? Particle hole symmetry is implemented as an on site symmetry in this 2D localized basis. Um, in any case, our binary states are centered on uh, the sites of a more honeycomb lattice, so AB or BA sites, while the peaks in the wave functions appear at the centers of these hexagons, which are the AA sites. These are the um, uh, well, I guess famous because they have been discussed uh, quite a bit, uh, so-called fidget spinner, um, uh, these three-peak uh, uh, Vanier functions for the narrow bands. So what I'm showing here uh, is the real space uh, picture of uh, uh, you know, W dagger W for this particular site. Okay. Um, so, so one and two in here just correspond to two different sites within the uh, unit cell. So in this particular case, they are centered on this white dot. Um, now, it will be helpful for us to also know uh, what is the real space structure of a product of two Vanier states, which uh, are centered on different sites. Um, and in this chiral limit, as we show in this paper, you can go into a basis in which this product is purely real. So we can just plot it. Uh, uh, as is. Um, and as you see, um, it, it clearly has this sort of a dipole type structure. Now, um, one thing is for sure, uh, the real space structure cannot have a monopole component. And that's because these are true Vanier states, so they are orthonormal. And so if you were to integrate this over all space, you have to get zero. Okay. And since this is real, somewhere you're going to get positive, somewhere you're going to have to get negative. So, so the monopole contribution to this multipole expansion has to vanish, unlike for the on-site term. But this one, there certainly is a monopole contribution. But all the other ones, they don't have a monopole contribution. So now that we have some idea, and by the way, uh, the further apart we put the centers of our Vanier states, the smaller um, uh, are the uh, wave functions. You see uh, 
on this um, color bar, um, it's getting actually fainter and well, the, the colors are saturated, but the, the color bar uh, is, uh, is changing uh, its magnitude. So indeed, uh, the further apart you put them, not surprisingly, they get smaller and smaller because they are exponentially multiplied. But, but for the nearest neighbors, for example, uh, it's not really uh, negligible, okay? And even for the next neighbor, it's not really negligible. So, so now we would try to use these bases to rewrite our dispersion. Um, the details are shown in this paper, uh, but the result is here. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking this, uh, let's see, uh, I'm taking this uh, Falk contribution and I write it in a type binding form. So I'm reporting here just the hoppings for the Falk contribution as a function of the distance between the two sites. And as I mentioned, this uh, uh, matrix is diagonal. So we are only remarkably only going to hop between the same sublattice site. Uh, the hopping between different sublattice sites actually vanishes identically in the chiral lift. So the first uh, equation uh, is the expression for the hopping constants for the Falk contribution. And the second term is the expression for the hopping constant in the Hartree contribution. Now, let's start by thinking about the Hartree contribution. Uh, there's a piece which, uh, oh, uh, sorry, I, this is a mistake. The, the oval should be on the right. Um, the sum over R, R prime here uh, uh, guarantees that this term on the right, so sorry about this, this oval should be circling the second parentheses, not the first parentheses. This, uh, this term here uh, is, uh, is periodic because of the sum over R prime. And so because it's periodic, um, if we think about this as an electrostatic problem, we have a periodic charge distribution. This first term, which I um, labeled periodic, which is not periodic, this is just a localized term, uh, represents some charge distribution Coulomb interacting with some periodic charge distribution. Okay, that's the that's the electrostatics of this problem, this fictitious problem. So now you can go to Fourier space here, and you notice that because this is periodic, it's only going to pick up the momenta of our Coulomb interaction, which start at the reciprocal momenta. So it starts at Q equal to zero, but at Q equal to zero, um, this actually vanishes because of the background charge contribution. So the first term that will actually contribute here is the Morel reciprocal lattice vector, okay? And that's because the second term in the parentheses is periodic, okay? So the fact that this is localized doesn't matter too much. Um, and so if you look at the value of this momentum in the units of the More period, it's actually, uh, about seven and a quarter divided by the Moret period. So if you now plug it into this formula, you see that you're evaluating the hyperbolic tangent at at least three and some change, uh, which is already pretty close to one. No matter what you put for Xi, as long as Xi is larger than one Moret period. So what this tells you is that the reason why we found oops, this Hartree contribution to be independent of the gate distance is because of, it's actually very simple. It's because we are only picking up the large wave vector, relatively large wave vector part of this Coulomb interaction due to the periodicity of this charge distribution. Okay, that's the reason why it's basically C independent while once C is larger than one more period. On the other hand, if we look at the exchange of contribution, um, it's different. In this case, both fictitious charges which contribute to this electrostatic problem are localized. Now, let's say, and so, so what does this mean? It means 
that is going to probe the, in principle, the entire Q dependence of this function. In particular, it can probe Q much less than this Moray wave vector. Now, um, let's say that we are interested in the on-site term. Okay, so this, in our type binding parameterization, this would correspond to an overall shift of our band. So in this case, capital R would be zero. So if capital R is equal to zero, in sum over R prime, there's also a term which has an R prime equal to zero. In which case, both of these binary states are centered on the same site. Um, and since, again, we're assuming that capital R is equal to zero, so we're looking at the on-site term. In the sum over R prime, again, capital R prime is zero. And again, the term on the right is also evaluated on the same side. Okay, so we pick I in the sum over I, we pick I equal to one. In this case, we're gonna get a fidget spinner Coulomb interacting with another fidget spinner. But as I mentioned, these fidget spinners, they contain a monopole contribution. So if you go to momentum space, their momentum structure is shown in this plot A. So now you have VQ, raw Q, raw minus Q, where raw Q looks like this. You see it's peak near small wave vectors. And so it's certainly probing the interaction at small Q because this localized charge distribution contains small wave vectors in, in this distribution. And so if Q is much less than one over C, well, um, uh, well, if Q is much less than one over uh, more lattice um, distance, then even for Xi larger than more lattice spacing, the R equal to zero contribution to the hopping is still going to have a gate distance dependence. And that explains why in the Fock contribution, we see an overall shift of our curves, okay? So as we change the gate distance, the gap is growing, okay? That's the reason for it, because we have a direct Coulomb repulsion between the two fidget spinners. Now, what about the dispersion? See, the dispersion is independent uh, of the gate distance once the gate distance is one more lattice spacing uh, away. So, uh, so that we can also understand because um, if R is non-zero, so we're describing hopping, then at least one of these terms has to have the two exponential localized Vanier states centered on different sites. That means, as I showed you before, that it cannot contain monopole contribution. It has to start with at least a dipole. And indeed, for the nearest neighbor ones, I show you uh, what the momentum Fourier transform of a dipole looks like. You see, it vanishes as it has to at small wave vectors. And so that means that it does not, it suppresses the contribution um, from small q, which means it's no longer sensitive to um, c larger than the Moray period. Okay? And so that explains why the shape of the dispersion is actually not changing. So what this would predict is that the effective mass of our excitations are not sensitive to how far the gates are placed, but the gap is, okay? And this comes directly from uh, understanding the vanierization. So here are the actual hopping constants uh, for a particular gate distance, which we chose to be five uh, more periods. The term in the center is the on-site term. Um, the, the, the values on the left, so you should think of them as the center is, uh, you, you hop from the center back to the center. Uh, and then this term is you hop from the center to this site. You see it's uh, symmetric. Um, and you see these hopping amplitudes are going down uh, as you move uh, further away. So indeed, uh, it is exponential localized. Um, it's a triangle lattice problem with a negative hopping which explains why the minimum is at gamma. And you notice that the hopping constants are almost the same for the exchange and for the heart rate contribution. 
which explains why there's this, uh, well, which explains why the shapes are basically the same. Okay, so now, um, what does this look like, therefore, for our excitations? So if we are at a charge neutrality point, then uh, this Hartree contribution doesn't do anything. Uh, all we've got is the exchange. Um, and then we get this, uh, both for particle and for the whole, we have a minimum at the gamma point with a dispersion that just looks like a triangle lattice hopping with the you know, negative nearest neighbor hopping constant, uh, plus a little bit more, but this is the basic uh, term. Again, uh, the y-axis is, is in units of the, uh, of the Coulomb scale. Now, if you go to nu equal to one, because of this uh, interference between these two terms, uh, if we try to add a hole to nu equal to one, its dispersion is extremely flat. On the other hand, if we try to add a particle, as I mentioned, the dispersion doubles in width. If we go to nu equal to two, because we add, well, subtract two of these Hartree contributions, the dispersion uh, uh, inverts. And so if you try to add a hole, you see it's gonna go still into these flat parts with the large density of states. On the other hand, if you try to add uh, a particle, it still goes to this minimum. And you go to three, uh, you just invert more, okay? Um, and so you see that at positive integer filling, um, adding a hole leads to heavy fermions because uh, the mass here is large. On the other hand, if we try to add a particle at positive integer fillings, uh, they go into this highly dispersive minima, and these are our light fermions. So the sawtooth cascade transitions um, can actually be understood by trying to interpolate between these limits. Uh, you saw in the inverse compressibility data that Pablo showed, that if you are at nu equal to one, and you try to add a particle, you go into uh, an almost incompressible state. Okay. Well, you can think of this as having a nice, um, uh, nice dispersion. You have a light fermions, um, and these light fermions, uh, as I will argue, uh, will form a Fermi liquid. On the other hand, if you try to take uh, particles away, so you add holes at nu equal to one, the dispersion is rather flat. The compressibility compressibility is going to be high, and you have it, you're going to get this sawtooth asymmetry between these two uh, cases. So this is shown here, uh, uh, where we numerically uh, just try to interpolate between the integer fillings by taking slightly determinant wave function. So we uh, allow uh, for population um, of these four bands um, in different ratios. Um, and uh, you see, starting from nu equal to one, going to nu equal to, sorry, starting from nu equal to zero, going to nu equal to one, um, uh, we, uh, we start first by filling democratically these four pockets uh, uh, at the gamma point. Uh, so you have a Fermi liquid here. And at some critical value of uh, nu, there is a, a, a phase transition in which one of these bands separates and eventually fills up while the other ones stay empty, okay? Then you reach nu equal to one, that's the exact dispersion I showed you. So the way this is being interpolated is that uh, each integer is basically exact. Um, this calculation was actually done away from the chiral limit uh, to be a little bit more realistic. And again, we started nu equal to one. We add particles. Uh, they first go democratically into these minima uh, 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 while keeping the already occupied uh, flat band here. Uh, and again, one of the bands will separate out. Eventually, you reach nu equal to two um, and you occupy two of these bands. And again, you get to the dispersion of the type that I mentioned. So the reason why the red and the green curves here are split as opposed to being on top of each other as in a higher limit is because we broke um, one of the symmetries that is present only in a higher limit. But other than that, you see that the shape of this dispersion is still basically the same. The minimum is at gamma, and then they're flat in this uh, M to K, K prime region. And then you just simply continue this way uh, until you fill up the band. Um, so if you then uh, ask for the total energy of the system, take a derivative with respect to particle number, you get the chemical potential. You see this cascade of the chemical potential with clear features of negative compressibility. Okay, um, you can do this by enforcing C2T symmetry. Um, so you can say, you know, this is strong coupling, everything is gapped. Uh, could you also get gapless phases? And I was hoping to discuss that um, if I still have some time. Um, in any case, this calculation shows you that you get basically the same feature in the compressibility, even if you enforce C2T, which at 
in this particular calculation at odd integer filling cannot open up a gap. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether you have gapped or gapless phases for these cascades to be present. Um, needless to say, Pablo's already mentioned this. Uh, these cascades have been observed um, in Shahal Ilani's group, uh, which plots. Uh, so this is the inverse compressibility. Um, you see the sawtooth asymmetry around each integer. And you also see this convex shape of the integrated chemical potential. So this is the chemical potential versus the filling. Um, uh, here, this is um, sort of almost incompressible, and then it gets flat here. In other words, it is highly compressible, sometimes even with a negative compressibility, uh, as you see in detail uh, here. So in my opinion, um, this can be explained using strong coupling, uh, as, I, as I discussed. Uh, there is additional data from uh, Amir Jacobi and Pablo uh, Harilo Herrero's collaboration uh, on samples which are probably hexagonal boronitride aligned. Uh, there you can also see these uh, sawtooth features clearly with negative compressibility. Um, and I think in this case, at positive integer fillings, they even saw gaps. Okay, I don't think I have enough time to explain why negative compressibility uh, is actually not does not signify thermodynamic instability. For those of you who uh, are interested in this, there's a very nice paper from 90s by Eisenstein, Pfeiffer, and West, um, where they actually measured this in a two DAG. Uh, the upshot of the story is that you're actually not really measuring the thermodynamic compressibility of the system. Um, you're taking away the Q equal to zero part of it um, in this experimental setup. So there's no problem with compressibility, quote unquote, compressibility being negative. I don't think I have enough time um, to discuss that. Uh, cascades of these uh, transitions in twisted bilayer graphene were also observed in STM by Ali Azdani, again, consistent with what I just showed you. The other thing that this picture explains is why the Landau fans point away from the charge neutrality point. Because it is only away from the charge neutrality point that you have light fermions. And so they're going to have a nice uh, Landau orbit uh, with well separated um, energies. While if you try to go towards the charge neutrality point, they're too heavy. So uh, you won't necessarily see the quantum oscillations there. Um, all right, so now I want to, so, so how much time do I have uh, right now? Um, well, I think if you, you can use another five minutes. If, uh... Five minutes, okay. So this is going to be lightning fast, but uh, uh, let, let me just uh, remind you what we did last lecture. We constructed these hybrid Vanier states. Um, I think Titus mentioned them today. Um, the particular direction along which we compute the um, projected uh, position operator is shown here. Um, this is the technology for this. I mentioned to you the wave functions have a rather interesting structure. They're not just simply Gaussians with the uh, peaks um, at the uh, centers of the Wilson loop eigenvalues. Uh, these are really expectation values. You should think of them as a mean over distribution. Uh, while the distribution has more structure. Um, and so now what we what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand, first of all, kinetic energy uh, in this uh, basis by constructing a smooth gauge. Um, this was done in this uh, paper explicitly. So for those of you who want to know how to construct smooth gauge um, in the um, hybrid Vanier basis, um, uh, please look at this paper. Uh, you see that the kinetic energy has two Dirac cones, and if you track the winding, you notice that the winding is the same. Now, um, what we did is we then uh, ran a DMRG calculation uh, with I tensor in that hybrid Vanier basis on a spinless one valley model. Okay, we could not add spin and valley uh, just simply because uh, of the numerical resources. Now, uh, but this was the first DMRG calculation on this problem. And what we found out is that as we change W0 over W1, so we start in a chiral limit, and then we crank it up to close to one. Um, not surprisingly, at W0 over W1 equal to zero, we found a, a churn state, so quantum anomalous Hall state with C2 T symmetry broken. Uh, that's very easy to describe in this basis. It's just a product state, because we occupy only one of the branches of this post loop. Um, but then, it, remarkably, there's a phase transition, um, uh, roughly at around 0.8, where uh, the system recovers C2T. And it either uh, breaks rotational symmetry or translate, so it certainly breaks rotational symmetry. But whether it also breaks translational symmetry or not, we were not able to resolve within our uh, numerics with the MRG. 
Um, all right. So, um, but what we noticed is that the occupancy of various hybrid Vanier orbitals is almost always one, with very little probability of double occupancy or single occupancy. Uh, moreover, we found out that the equal time correlation functions um, between either the same churn number or opposite churn number is extremely fast decaying function. So it's basically only on site correlate. This made us uh, use this trial state uh, uh, for, uh, for, for doing additional refinement um, going to larger system size of this variational calculation. Um, now, I don't have enough time to describe the result of this variational calculation. Just to show you that uh, it recovers the result of the DMRG. Uh, and it also recovers this transition. Now, the upshot of the story is that there are three competitive states that we find in this calculation. So first is a quantum anomalous hold state, which I already mentioned before, which um, has which is a gap state um, with a dispersion of the similar type that I showed you before with a minimum uh, at the gamma point. Um, needless to say, such states have been observed uh, experimentally in samples which were hexagonal boron nitrate aligned, and more recently, even in samples that are not, uh, and even a zero magnetic field, but by Dima Epitope's group. But there are two other states which seem uh, highly competitive. Now, one of these states um, is, uh, is a pneumatic state, so state which breaks rotational symmetry, but does not break translation symmetry. And remarkably, it also does not break C2T symmetry. Now, I showed you it was the C2T that gave you the same winding number of the two Dirac cones. And so what's basically happening is that you're moving these two Dirac cones closer and closer together. And now the minimum of the dispersion is still at the gamma point, okay? Uh, even though the non-interacting problem would have a minimum of the dispersion uh, at uh, K and K prime. Um, uh, and that state is gapless. On the other hand, uh, there was another state, which is also extremely competitive, which we found, which break translational symmetry uh, and made the, and doubled the period. Uh, but it did not break C2T symmetry. Okay. We call that one a C2T stripe state. Remarkably, despite the fact that it did not break C2T symmetry, that state is gapped. So the question is, how is this possible? You have two Dirac cones, which have equal winding number. You did not change their chirality. All you did is broke translational symmetry. How can you get rid of them? And the way to understand this, um, is by this very nice uh, picture uh, introduced by Tomasz Duszek and collaborators, where uh, you can think of it schematically as follows. Once we double the period, we need to fold our Brillouin zone. When we fold our Brillouin zone, then in addition to the two equal winding number Dirac cones that we had uh, between the bands two and three, we are also gonna pick up new Dirac cones, which are for the bands away from the chemical potential. And these are marked by red and blue here. Now it turns out that the topological charge of these Dirac cones actually now depends on the path you take um, uh, between them because of the presence of the Dirac nodes in the proximate bands sketched here. So for example, you can't annihilate these nodes if you take them along this dashed curve, but if you take them along this uh, solid curve, you can, because um, one way to think about this is that if you wind once around one of the nodes, the topological charge will change, and now you can annihilate. In any case, if you want to see the details of this, um, you, you can also see it in this paper uh, written over here. So this is the actual mechanism. It's actually non-abelian Dirac node braiding that allows you to have a state which does not break C2T. It only breaks translation symmetry, uh, does not break value U1 symmetry, does not mixing the remote bands and still gaps out uh, the spectrum. Uh, so we show exactly uh, how this is done. Here, um, there is a follow up DMRG um, work by Mike Zalato's group with more accurate algorithm, which basically reproduces uh, our results. They also find the tradition at 0.8, they find a quantum anomalous whole state, and there the DMRG is able to resolve this competition in favor of this uh, thematic state. But again, they find that the energy of the stripe state. Is extremely competitive. Since we don't really know the Hamiltonian to that uh, degree of detail, these are states which we should consider. Now, finally, I'd like to say that there was a recent experimental uh, report um, by Amir Jacobi and Pablo Carrillo Herrero's collaboration, 
where they saw signatures um, of uh, states uh, uh, which had this um, doubling of the unit cell, uh, broken transcriptional symmetry. Um, okay, so since I'm out of time, let me just uh, stop here and uh, uh, take questions. All right, thank you, Oscar. So I think we have time for one or two short questions. Okay, since we are running a bit a bit late, maybe uh, if there are no quick questions, then then let's uh, stop here. Let's take a break of uh, fifteen minutes. So we will be back at uh, five oh five at Bilbao time. Uh, there is a Slack channel if you want to ask uh, questions anytime. Yes. Oh yeah, and I, I also take advantage to remind that there is also a Slack channel with the posters of the participants, so you can also take advantage of the break to, to go through them. And uh, thank you, Oscar, for these really, really complete talks about everything that thank has you. been done. Thank you. I'm very sure that the students are gonna watch the videos again and make questions on Slack. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, we'll be back in 15 minutes.
Okay, so let's uh, resume uh, our session of today. Uh, so our uh, last speaker of today is uh, Rebecca Rivero Palau from the French uh, CNRS. And uh, she's gonna tell us, I believe, some, some experimental aspects on, uh, on graphene and boron nitride systems. So whenever you you want, Rebecca, please just oh you are sharing already your screen. So please. yeah, I think so. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you, Maria. Uh, so first, let me check. Everybody can hear me and everything. We so can everybody can. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I found very funny that everybody was sharing, was changing the virtual background uh, to the place where they are, and I thought of taking a picture of the outside of the lab because we are in a very beautiful lab. But it turns out that the weather this summer in Paris is awful. So I decided to put something that I consider even more beautiful. There is the inside of, uh, of our lab. So if the postdoc doesn't move for one hour, <laughs> don't be scared, he's just a picture. Uh, so today um, I would like to talk about uh, topologically valid states in graphene DN systems. So I consider this to be a very good example of uh, a topological state that is uh, developed in a very simple system. This is just the first version or the first part of this talk that is today's talk is just the monolayer version. And tomorrow we're gonna see the by layer, a little bit more complicated uh, version. So I consider this a very extremely simple system. It's just graphing uh, on boronitride, a line on boronitride, and uh, turns out to be, uh, for me, a very beautiful uh, example of uh, topological states. So uh, before starting, why do we want to this, this uh, Bali states uh, in graphing? Well, uh, we all know that we are always looking for new states of matter that uh, will hopefully one day become uh, uh, applications or technological developments. Uh, in our case, we focus on Bali states because uh, Bali states in graphene are very robust given the, the large uh, space in momentum, uh, the large separation in momentum space. Uh, of the two valleys of graphene, so uh, inter valley scattering is reduced. In, uh, in this, using this kind of systems, we can develop uh, what is the future, what we hope it will be the future uh, Balletronics uh, devices. So, of course, uh, I know you all have seen this a thousands of times, but I really need it in order to know that everybody is uh, starting from the same point. So uh, graphene, you know this very well, it's an hexagonal lattice of uh, carbon atoms where we have two sublattices, A and B, as you can see here. Uh, it's a uh, very long zone, it's also an hexagon and we have two equivalent points in the, uh, at the corners of this real one. So it's electronic band structure is something that by now we all know by heart. It's a linear energy dispersion. And these two Dirac cones touch to each other uh, at the K and K prime points. Uh, in this are, of course, what we were talking about, uh, the valleys. Now, as an experimentalist, if I'm going to talk about anything, I'm going to show you also an experiment that goes with, or that at least I consider that uh, that is a, a good example of it. So if we take just a layer of, uh, of graphing, I hope you can all see my, my mouse. Uh, so if we take, we just take a layer of graphing as we did so many years ago uh, on silicon oxide and we connect it electrically. We pass a current through it and we measure the voltage drop across. And uh, we use, of course, this graphene is deposited on an insulator, which has a highly conductive silicon layer underneath and we can apply a gate voltage. So if we do this, we are able to tune the Fermi energy of the system. We can see 
in here that the resistance as a function of the gate will strongly increase at the charge neutrality point, and then it will decrease. In fact, uh, I think Pablo already mentioned this, but uh, why not to repeat it? Uh, in fact, this is one of the most uh, interesting characteristics of graphing in terms of future applications is the fact that we can change the nature of uh, the carriers. We can pass from a conduction of electrons to a conduction of poles. But of course, this electronic body structure has other characteristics that are also uh, important. Um, for example, we have a very phase of pi. So let me just remind you that a very phase is this additional phase that the electron uh, carries on once it finishes uh, an arm. So now uh, the example, the clearest example of uh, these uh, consequences of the pi very phase of graphing, and uh, let's say that the one that is the more dearest to my heart is the formation of Landau level, how uh, the Landau level spectrum will change, will be uh, modified by this binary phase. So one of its characteristics is the formation of the N equals zero Landau levels, one of the most clear characteristics in the Landau level spectrum. So just to, to know that we are all in the same page, when I talk about the quantum Hall effect, uh, Let's say the best example, we all get it when we talk about conventional dimensional electron gases with parabolic bands. We apply a magnetic field and we can see, sorry, and we can see that the energy, uh, the energy is split in uh, levels. These are called the Landau levels. In the case of a two-dimensional electron gas, these Landau levels are equally spaced. Now, of course, but 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 happen in an experiment. So if we take a whole bar of a conventional, made in a conventional uh, two-dimensional electron gas, we pass a current and we measure the voltage drop at but, uh, both uh, parts, we will see uh, in this wonderful Wikipedia animation the formation of Landau levels. And uh, at the same time, what we have in the longitudinal resistance is oscillations of the longitudinal resistance and a quantization of the values of the transverse resistance. So this is due to the formation of chiral edge states along our sum. So this uh, quantization of the Landau level, so, sorry, this quantization of the transfer resistance, it's so uh, well quantized. In fact, it depends only on fundamental constants of uh, nature as uh, Planck's constant and electron charge. So this is such a, a good um, value, it's such a robust effect that in fact it has been used as a practical electrical resistance standard of the international system of units since the 90s. But when we talk about graphing, as I told you before, uh, things change. So this linear energy dispersion of graphene and this pi very phase will have a strong consequences. And you can see the difference between the Landau, uh, the Landau level formation of all systems. So as I told you before, the first will be the N equal to zero Landau level. And then we also have uh, the fact that the Landau levels 